Um, I um, would just like to take a minute to introduce our next speaker, Kim Story. Um, Kim is an architect practicing in Toronto with um, uh, her partner James Brown as Brown and Story Architects. They are uh, both graduates of the University of Toronto um, and are, I, I would say, to, to, um, to, to most people would, uh, would know uh, Kim's work of, um, as the designer of Dundas Square uh, in Toronto, um, as well, perhaps, uh, of the, uh, the design for uh, St. George Street through uh, the, the University of Toronto campus. Um, they are, I would, I, I would say, you know, they're not, uh, the, the, the firm of Brown and Sorry are not uh, monument builders, but they're definitely city builders. Uh, they're kind of the, the, you know, architects, designers that have worked um, incessantly and exquisitely well in the background, uh, uh, maintaining, I would say, the, the most important uh, uh, values that have uh, uh, held Toronto together uh, over these years. They're very much, uh, for me, always been uh, the conscience of, uh, of the, the city of Toronto. Uh, they've produced over the years numerous, numerous uh, planning reports, studies, either commissioned or work that they've done on their own. Um, uh, one that comes to mind to me that it was uh, remarkably significant uh, was, was uh, done uh, uh, fairly early on in, in terms of recognizing the significance of Toronto, uh, the geography of Toronto, the topography of Toronto, and the significance of the uh, uh, ravine system, the creeks that ran through the city, most of which uh, are now buried. And uh, long before most people uh, became preoccupied with mappings, uh, mapping cities, uh, Kim and uh, James uh, produced a remarkable set of plans which very, very few people knew what to do with or what to make of. Uh, trying to understand Garrison Creek, which of course comes down uh, and terminates where our site is uh, today. Um, uh, there, this, this was visionary work, work that was kind of done on their own, uh, 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 and their in, incessant curiosity, uh, trying to understand what makes the city work and how can we make it better. Um, so just a quickly, quick kind of run through uh, the bio. Um, uh, she, uh, uh, she is a, a founding power partner of both uh, Brown and Story Architects and the Office of Responsive Environments. Uh, she's been primarily involved in urban design, civic infrastructure work, and its ability to leverage transformations uh, to the public realm, focusing on active transportation, uh, uh, International Gateway, uh, Montreal, Victoria Park Station, West Toronto Rail Path, uh, which is partially built and I guess is still continuing, uh, uh, Leslie uh, Lakeshore uh, Perimeter Landscape Water Infrastructure, including the Garrison Creek uh, regeneration, the Lower Dawn Regeneration, Lauren Park uh, Water Treatment Plant Parks, the Massey Harris Park, uh, which is also close to uh, our site, uh, Kingston Park, St. Hilda's Walk, Public Space, uh, uh, very notably the uh, Young Dundas Square, uh, and a Green Line competition, and street, street, streetscape projects, including, again, uh, St. George Street, Bloor Street, Young Street, College Street, and Leslie Street. I knew uh, Kim when I was a student, um, and she was a, a young graduate. And I have to say very personally, I'm very glad that she is here today, because uh, in many ways, uh, I found her enthusiasm, her passion uh, for architecture, uh, the risks that they took, the, the kind of moral position that they took in, 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 in the work that they did as kind of young graduates. Uh, back then as uh, incredibly inspiring. And I'm very glad uh, that you could join us here again today. Kim, thanks. Well, I think I should be floating over here. Jeez. And Rick should also add we're perennially broke, right? That's, that's also kind of, we're perennially broke at Brown and Story as well, right? That's, that's part of that whole formula of risk taking and vision and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yes. I like to I like to explain that to my creditors. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So um, it is so nice to be 
in Cambridge, back at University of Waterloo. Um, hi, Stephen Otto. It's nice to see you. What I wanted to talk about today was um, a lot of the civic design work that we have been, we've had experience with over the last many years. Um, and and the, the idea of, of large systems of public spaces or the large kind of the, the large possibilities of civic infrastructure and, and latent systems to completely regenerate systems in the city of public space. Um, and the form of that, that actually has seems, seems to be preoccupying us in the last several years, well actually almost 20 years if you count St. George Street here, um, is the sort of the linear nature of, of, a, of a landform that uh, began, took, a, took form for us uh, when we were talking about St. George Street, which is nearly 20 years old now. But uh, that project was something interesting for us because uh, it pointed out to us in the, first, in the first business that the success of that street depended on, on the traffic engineers and the city and the political will and private donors to really come together to make a civic kind of gesture in the city that would, that would have some uh, real relevance rather than a superficial streetscaping kind of project. Um, and I was, I was kind of uh, laughing to myself when Michael, and I really enjoyed Michael's talk very much, uh, but when he was talking about the turning radius, because one of the things when we had our meetings with St. George Street is that there was always a part, and we had meetings every two weeks, and we had the engineers at the table, and parks, and the university, and, and uh, very often uh, the mayor would drop in, or the president of the university, and, uh, and it would always come down to what the turning radius was going to be. And they would say, and, and the engineers at that point, and this was before really too many people were working in computers at that point, and, and they had a box, a special, it was like the holy grail, they would bring out with turning radii in them, and they would bring them out and place them on the drawing to check that we had drawn where we were supposed to be drawn. And it was, it was like the ceremony every, every two weeks to check what we were doing. But in fact, I mean, and what was interesting about St. George Street was that we had city engineers. It was just, just before the amalgamation. So the engineers working on the project were quite aware of city standards and pedestrian standards that were important there. Now it's very difficult because you have an amalgamation, so you have engineers from all over the different boroughs who have very strong feelings about, uh, you know, turning radii for garbage trucks and for fire engines and things like that, who couldn't possibly expect it to go over a curb in an emergency. So really, that was a, it's, it's a it, sorry, it's a huge difference that we have now. So in in any rate, that taught us about. Take bringing civic infrastructure into the mix when you're talking about urban design. You're talking about that idea about middle space, which is what we kind of call urban design in our office. Uh, a next scale of that is really looking at, at the idea of the, the West Toronto Rail Path, which is really a very, very narrow piece. But the interesting thing about these narrow for landforms is that you actually have so much edges of them to actually make transformation around their edges. And St. George Street at the time really did start to transform the edges along St. George Street. And then the West Toronto Rail Path along its edges has transformed the possibility of connecting into neighborhoods where there once was, a, once was chain link fences. And then at another greater scale is really uh, the, the YUL, MTL kind of uh, UNESCO competition that we entered a couple of years ago looking at Auto Route 20 going from Pierre Elliott Trudeau um, airport all the way to the uh, Centreville and uh, looking at another kind of uh, route, an indifferent sort of iso isotropic kind of response to that in a new landform that would wind its way there and start transforming that sort of wasteland that occurs through there. So of those three scales, I wanted to talk first about West Toronto Rail Path um, very briefly, but the idea about the rail path was that um, Sorry, I keep switching hands here. That what you had was a, an abandoned, aban well, the city was able to uh, get a, a, one of the lines of the rail corridor that goes down all the way from Georgetown down to the core of the city. And within that space of about nine meters, uh, we were able to, we, we had the first phase of the rail path and that included kind of making, making connections to the street. And basically, it was, it was actually a new landscape of the city that not many people had, had the benefit of seeing. And it was a beautiful, wild landscape that really was uh, something 
new and, and having that kind of long view. I mean, people talk about Prospect Park in Brooklyn being the perfect space for the, the long view. Well, we have our meadow, basically, our wild meadow in Toronto in these spaces. So that the, uh, the West Toronto Rail Path, within that space, uh, and I can't begin to tell you the, tr the trouble we had trying to get a cyclist path that actually curved. We had to basically, uh, there was a, a scene in a bar at the beginning of this project where we were sitting with a cyclist expert who said, no, it should go, he brought 11 by 17 drawings, said this is the plan you have to draw, and it was a straight line from there to there. And we said, no, we could curve it because we can make this a, a multi-use multi path where you can actually have a linear park that goes there which gives us also the opportunity of making connections into these dead-end streets, which are de dead-ending into chain-link fences because of that being a rail corridor. And so, uh, we, my, as it turned out, the bill was outrageous because every time I would excuse myself and go to the main bar, I'd take a shot of whiskey because I couldn't handle it. And my partner, James, was doing the same thing, except I didn't know he was doing it. So we kept coming back to the table a little bit more. It was like one of those Popeye cartoons. You see a fist coming out here and a cloud of dust. And, Finally, we kind of wrestled it down to the ground, but the bill was unbelievable for the bill. So, anyways, probably talking too much about that. But the idea, the idea of the rail path in any event is that what you have in a short period of space, you have connections to streets going into the neighborhoods, which now could loop through. I'm sorry, I wanted to point that out in this one, Lord. So where you had all these streets here that came down and stopped, uh, at dead ends now could loop. So you had this whole long three kilometer space that could kind of loop back into the neighborhood. So you could have a walk that's like that, or you can have a walk like this, like that. But what it gave a whole new public face to that, and also gave a whole new public face for new buildings, new housing, come, all, which is all starting to come up along this face, which is really kind of that kind of transformative or regenerative ability of a very narrow and long piece of infrastructure in the city. And at these points, this is a bridge going over one of either Bloor Street or, or Dundas West, um, what you, or sorry, DuPont or um, uh, Dundas West, is you have a, a collection of, of a number of things. You have active transportation of people riding, people walking, jogging, dog walking, all those things. You have an edge of a green boundary of, you know, of the long view that we were talking about. You have bridge connections that go across streets and connections up from the street into that and all the new community linkages, and you have a train going right beside it. And it all seems to coexist quite happily. So taking that experience on the West Toronto Rail Path, uh, the, the uh, UNESCO competition for the International Gateway for Montreal was one where, we were, where you were supposed to somehow uh, deal with the fact of a, a jet, you know, the Auto Route 20, which created a whole area of you know, this kind of landscape, which we are fairly familiar with in Toronto as well, to a certain extent, but the auto route really has it down pat. Uh, so what you, and this is sort of the, it's about a 17 kilometer stretch, and so it's in, I'm just showing it in two areas, so you can see the pathway of this and, and the interchanges that come along this auto route, which are really quite uh, extraordinary, as they, and they create this whole swath of disconnected areas in the city where you have, you know, they've disconnected communities, they, you have, you know, backs of industrial areas which sort of sprawl around the space, and, um, and you know, very lovely edges like that. And so, when we were looking at this, we looked at uh, the, there is a, a um, in the CCA, in their book about Montreal, they collected some really interesting things about Montreal in the 60s. They had three different models how the city should uh, be progressing. One was the concentrated model and the galactic and the star-shaped. And for us, we thought, well, what we should be looking at was a star-shaped model for, for uh, this project. And so what we actually started to work with was an idea of a sort of isotropic system that would that would allow to make, that would, that would be almost indifferent to the actual path of the actual uh, highway, which you can see sort of ghosted in here. So basically we suggested a new landform that would uh, create, and that, that new landform is really that kind of yellow shape going through there that starts meandering through that territory. And we create a new territory, a new centered, it, it would recenter that territory. So the idea of that, which is really, this is sort of the, the uh, sort of, very kind of biological looking shape of that. That is a space that actually takes in things like active transportation routes, uh, uh, a new subway or, or a light rail transit or parks. 
um, or connections to, to neighborhoods. So the idea of this, as it kind of ran through the neighborhood, it would be that, that tissue, that green space tissue, that would actually start connecting into those spaces that were previous, previously disconnected. And to really kind of explain that better, I have to go back to actually, way back, to uh, Garrison Creek again, because the idea of that as a, as a model, the ravine model, is that kind of latent system that works through the city. This is, that shows the outline of the actual ravine um, and shows the park systems that are on it. And you can sort of see this, and you can see it in some of uh, Michael's slides as well. Certainly Bickford Park is part of that. Um, but where you see that kind of latent system working through the city, which actually forms, a, uh, in its own sort of way, kind of connects a lot of neighborhoods together, not as well as it could, for sure. But that system, which also kind of connected, had that kind of stickiness to its edges, so it connected cultural things around it, like this is a, along St. Hilda's Walk in Trinity Bellwoods Park, which is the grass amphitheater, they're playing Aristophanes the Frog here. Uh, and, this, and, and the mapping of these things, which, where it actually started making connections through the city. This was showing all those Main Street areas uh, that, were, that people were talking about intensifying in 1990 and 1991. So how that kind of system of, of the ravine could actually provide new open space for people living on those Main Street's intensified areas. How this created sort of hot spots where the, where the ravine actually crossed the special spots in the city, where the bend in College Street is, for instance. Uh, those things are actually formed by landforms that have caused that to happen. Uh, this is actually, and then taking the idea of, of actually the water infrastructure, stormwater uh, infrastructure, and talking about how you could create a connected pond system that would deal with um, the water system, the, the you know, rainwater being collected through this through a natural watershed. This is uh, part of the Trinity Bellwoods Park system, which some people apparently thought at the time had been caused by someone dropping a bomb um, accidentally during the World War, um, and it wasn't. Um, this is part of the, the ravine, which used to be much deeper. But this is a space that's about 80 meters wide, and so that's the sort of the kind of space that we imagine sort of that you would create running through, uh, through the auto route territory that would make those connections of public parkways, of active transportation systems that would actually connect the center of the city all the way out to the airport. So, and this is one of those kind of views of, of one of the proposed sort of re-earthing of a, a ravine landscape in Trinity Bellwoods Park that, uh, that we worked on. So that kind of shows a sort of a maybe a sort of an image of what the, that yellow ribbon, this yellow ribbon actually is because we didn't have time in the competition to draw 17 kilometers of, of uh, bike paths. But the idea was this is a, a sort of a, a thing that actually contains, contains you know, areas in it that could be built with kind of public amenities, a path network, uh, water systems, green areas, a subway line, and a road network within it as well. So this would become a sort of a complete, it would be completely indifferent to the actual auto route, but actually make ideas of, of new connections to new parks, uh, agricultural zones uh, and existing city blocks that rather than having a, a, a you know concrete wall with those lovely noise barriers they have uh, to actually have an open zone that creates connections from one side of it to the other um, the section and that's a, a detail of that so the idea of this as a this yellow piece is something that would have a whole different number of top topographical um, Characteristics. So as it travels through the city, it moves up, it moves down, it moves, you know, shifts to the side, it becomes carved. So we drew a lot of uh, profiles that would occur through it. So you know, you have the, you know an elevated system. You might have a, a light rail system or a subway system traveling through it. It might have some water systems, um, and then you know, just drew a whole series of how those reliefs would actually move through uh, those areas and make those connections. Uh, the, and this was also spawned by earlier kind of preoccupations of our office about, make, about string networks, so you, how that string kind of connects, collects things around it, like larger assemblages of, of things like an airport, like a large uh, mo mobility hode uh, node, sorry, and, and ideas that like large chunks, like large kind of neighborhoods could also then start become, become to be kind of knit into a, an open space network. So this, is a, a, so this is actually a larger view of this, so you can see you know, the original auto route network going through there. And then this piece, sort of traveling around it and through it, 
making these connections to industrial zones, kind of rationalizing industrial sort of parks to become part of that, making connections through parks into existing neighborhoods. And it was, you know, it was a quite obviously very ambitious idea, but as a conceptual idea, we thought this was a kind of an interesting way as a landform and, and to create a new, a new topography and a new infrastructure within that kind of wasteland of space that was really sort of a no man zone that was really up there that could be taken, that could be taken advantage of. Um, some of the details of that uh, are really the idea of moving into the, you know, moving into the airport zone at, at this end so that you had a lot of kind of connections of, of roadways and pathways and you could actually imagine riding your bike to the airport. Uh, looking at the intermodal, intermodal square at a certain point where it would actually create in a new residential zone, create uh, going into a, an existing residential zone, providing new uh, areas for higher density housing, and then creating, you know, just creating all these kind of possibilities for new development in an area that was really thought of as a, as a kind of a zero possibility space. This is a, a plan of that. So you can see, I mean, there's a lot of detail work and consideration that, can, that we brought into this trying to imagine how these things actually connected into. The idea as well is that looking at the industrial zones, which were kind of really kind of spread all over the place, but finding a way to kind of consolidate that within the same amount of area, but in a more rationalized system that created fronts and edges that could be contained. Uh, a lifestyle center looking at the existing mall that's in this position where it can actually become something that kind of spans right over the highway, connecting it to two areas of the new open space systems running through it. And also looking in it as a zone that would connect into existing neighborhoods, making open space connections and linkages into existing neighborhoods and providing new spaces for, uh, for new housing so that where these things came through, you would have different kind of neighborhoods running along there that create that kind of new kind of finger landscapes that would come into there, which could be as simple, simple as a bike path or a path with trees, but the whole idea of a landscape and a public space landscape being that connection point, uh, linking into parks, Parc en Grignon. Um, and then uh, part of this would also start forming a, a new public space edge along the Lachine Canal, which at this point really seems to have a, a bit of a green fringe on it, but actually making that part of a, a, new, a, a much larger and ambitious public space landscape where it connects into this, uh, the isotropic form, which then connects into new neighborhoods, into existing neighborhoods. So really, uh, as you can see, you know, the, the landscape, new building, a new, uh, the new landscape form traveling through here, which actually starts to uh, create, then this was going to be the video, <laughs> which doesn't work. We'll just try it just to make sure it doesn't, no, it doesn't work. Um, okay. So, that was a larger idea for uh, this wasteland, but using a larger kind of space as a civic, a linear, a linear infrastructure, a linear lin uh, landform that would create that kind of uh, new landscape that would start as a huge kind of connection piece. Okay. This was also brought to an area, uh, it was called the Green Line Competition in London, England, that connected a series of reservoirs, uh, industrial reservoirs, to the area of the Olympic kind of area at the south. And what, uh, what this was also meant to do in a similar way, you see we've, we've re-sort of uh, quoted the, the sections from the uh, Montreal competition, but creating another new edge of public space of a series of raised terraces, uh, a forest, and the, and the strand that kind of connect all, that would connect all the way along this series of reservoirs and uh, what we call these things like eggs, which kind of move into the reservoir itself, and that start to make a kind of a, a new landscape again, creating a, a zone, a connection between this industrial zone or these industrial water bodies and a residential area here. So again, that kind of connective zone of a, a public space system that would actually create that new zone. And this is something more possibly what we're talking about in Montreal where we weren't able to get into that level, level of detail. So you see the forest, the strand, series of terraces, boardwalk, and the eggs that border on these bodies of water which then form connections into uh, a series of you know, potential kind of building sites along that which connect into residential areas. 
I wanted to also kind of show the uh, work that we did at the Lower Dawn Regeneration. Uh, we were part of uh, one of the teams that competed when we didn't win. But uh, we worked with uh, Stoss Landscape Urbanism out of Boston and uh, with Zoss Architects in, um, in Toronto. And uh, that competition was preceded by work that we had done earlier when we, were, uh, we wanted to do some work for an environmental assessment with the TRCA, which we also didn't get, but we put a lot of work into it, um, which looked at the idea of what happened at the mouth of the dawn. So this was before the actual competition, uh, the international one had started. But the idea of that was really to create, again, another landform where you, you thought about the huge kind of area in the watershed of the Don River coming down from North Toronto all the way down to, you know, and channeled into the Keating Channel. How would you, how would you deal with that as a new mouth? So our idea was the idea of creating a new estuary at the, at the mouth so that you would create kind of islands that would create new areas of program and allow flooding to kind of distribute itself through there when the, water, when the water level rose. So this was sort of a beginning sort of preoccupation for us on that project. Uh, this was the end, uh, the, the final project for the, was one of the five entries where the idea was to bring a series of, of linear kind of uh, parks through that system so that when the water level would rise, then all of these things would become flooded. So what you would have at its high water level was a series of kind of new spits into, into, uh, into, lake, into the harbor. And, uh, but within those, you would have finger parks, which would become areas that would become dry and wet, depending upon the level of the dawn. So that was a whole system that we, uh, we worked very carefully with. Um, the Stoss worked very hard on, on the actual uh, mechanics of, of uh, you know, the water rising and flood controls. And, uh, and we were sort of tasked on this project to really look at the idea of how you actually occupied these spits of land and looked at new kind of architectural typologies. It was our, it was our point of view that this was such an extraordinary part of the city that it really didn't, it didn't make sense to take it in sort of a, a, a lobotomy, sort of a new urbanism point of view, take what works at, in, in the established Toronto neighborhoods that work quite well where they are and somehow bring that down to the waterfront in a sort of a, a brain transfer. But what we thought was more interesting was to really look at that as a, as a unique event in the history of the city and try to find an architecture that responded to those new landforms, which again were a response to an infrastructure that dealt with water control. So these are some of the earlier views, study views that we were looking at that looked at the idea of the structure of these uh, spits of land coming through and these areas of land that would be the lower level land that would take on water over those different times. These are different kind of... Uh, views of, of that kind of uh, gradients, looking at different grid relationships, uh, island spit relationships, where channels come through, that's the shipping channel going through there, again through there. We, this didn't make it into the final project, so when I was looking through these slides um, this past week for this talk, I was really fascinated that I really like these much better than the finished plan. So I want to include those in because there's a certain a dynamic that's very interesting about working with large infrastructure systems. And again, this is looking at one of those conjunction spaces where we call the, the big N here for a major sort of institutional site. Um, and then you can see through this kind of more finished, uh, the modeling from Stoss, how this, this kind of space comes through these and creates these kind of spits of, of land, which are connected by land when it's dry and would be divided by water when it's wet. So to develop a new kind of typology, we started looking at different block structures that were adjacent in sort of this founding neighborhood. So we had the original sort of 10 blocks of the old city. We had the Corktown blocks, which are a smaller grid. And we had the kind of super blocks that were being established in uh, the West Donlands. And really started to kind of look at what the characteristics of those and how those could be combined to make a new typology in in that kind of shape of, of the new kind of spits coming through there. So we did these kind of progressive studies looking at the outlines of these and started kind of showing uh, movement patterns, open space, courtyard types, how these things would all start kind of creating a zone on a spit. How would you occupy that in a, in a fairly unique way but in a way that still created good relationships between 
open spaces that would connect from there into the larger kind of spits of park uh, that would surround these spaces. So we embarked, and I'm not going to go through all of these things, but, but the idea is that these things really uh, take a lot of work and study to create the type of housing typologies that, that will work in a specific area. So these are things that we worked very hard on. We looked at very kind of unique types that would reach right across the spit um, that would create kind of spots, the ground floor plan, how that would work, how they would work at upper floor plans, parking, all of those kind of criteria. And then started doing, you know, a whole series of sort of, of uh, drawings. What, what's kind of interesting about our office is that my partner, I will, I will, I'm going to uh, rat him out. He doesn't use a computer. And so what's interesting is, is, is that we have maintained in the office a kind of a, a way of straddling all those worlds where we can, we can uh, you know, do the computer work with the best of them, but we also have a really nice facility, I think, in the office of, of working by hand. And I think that's really critical uh, to keep drawing and to keep exploring these things by hand rather than uh, by the computer. Um, so basically, this is sort of a family of kind of building types that we worked on to uh, insert into these spaces. One of these is a typical kind of uh, type of building typology sheets that we created that looked at kind of the spaces going up, how they, how they work together in the series, um, you know, the number of units you got to each one, um, the areas, and, uh, and in an optimum, a minimum, and a maximum. So if the optimum was about, was about the number that we wanted to reach the densities that the Waterfront Toronto was asking for, then there was a minimum if they wanted to go less dense and maximum if they wanted to go more dense. So we try to create that kind of range and uh, vocabulary for, uh, for the built forms. So in the small courtyard building, you have basically a building form that kind of adapt to uh, low rise, higher rise, a courtyard that connect to an open space or street system, which is very important. What we were doing, the running building was something that was more about running on, on longer streets along the spit. Uh, branching towers, more about creating kind of profiles, uh, head and tail. You can see how these kind of work and creating kind of large kind of open spaces between them uh, in these spaces. So it was really was trying to find things that responded to a new kind of water landscape. Uh, the large courtyard buildings in the, in the larger areas, because there was about a million, they, they wanted about a million square meters of space on, on uh, this development, so we were quite uh, sure that we needed to do this in a very kind of rational and smart way. So these are all these building types. And this was the idea too, here you would have a system where you could cross uh, in this sort of pedestrian bridge type that would kind of link into new building types and create that kind of parkland kind of traveling through all those things. Again, this is one of the kind of the spit developments looking at one of those branching tower types that would come right through there more building types, and then the idea of, you know, what this would look like on the ground, and then what this looks like called in the sky. What would be the profile from the larger kind of view, and a larger contextual view of those higher buildings, and what kind of pattern they made from, uh, from, a, from a larger, larger view from the uh, part of the city. We did a whole series of looking at how bridges worked, how we could make connections, as, uh, bridges themselves being that kind of middle space uh, other than just a passage for cars, how you made that kind of work with branches for pedestrian cycling and make connections into that open space system that we had created. It's another view of, of part of one of, the, one of the water parks coming in. And then the larger view of this as a new precinct in the city, creating kind of density and, and a whole range of, of low to medium to high density within a, in a fairly unique landform in the city. I wanted to go back to the West Toronto Rail Path for a moment because that was a system, again, where it was important that we were looking at the new landscape and the long view. And these, the rail corridors are another system in the city that I think are quite critical to look at now, um, where we have that ability kind of to, to connect into the neighborhood, but you still have a larger kind of corridor that originally cut through the city and, and in the same way that Auto Route 20 has done in Montreal, but create that kind of cut through the city, which has cuts off neighborhood, cuts off ability to, to make connections, which are very important for any city to make. And again, making, allowing, or understanding that those things can coexist in close quarters. Um, I'm not going into the whole presentation about, but I wanted to finish um, what I was talking about 
by looking at this union pair, uh, the Metrolink's work being done on the, uh, the link between the airport and Union Station, where this kind of rail, port, rail corridor, which is right beside the uh, West Toronto Rail Path, is something that is going to be getting sound barrier walls across its whole length. These are the opportunities that we have now in the city. We have opportunities when, it, when you have to spend, uh, you know, a billion dollars on, on water, on flood management at the foot of the dawn, when you have to spend a billion dollars, I don't even know what a billion dollars is, but a billion dollars, uh, you know, creating a new rail link between uh, an airport and a, and a train station. These are opportunities for growth. This is when you need to kind of, uh, cities and uh, provincial governments and federal governments have to look at these as opportunities to completely regenerate and transform the cities that we have now. These were things that were made that were necessary at the time, but we have the ability now, but not the political will, to uh, find those ways to make those work. In the, in the rail link, if it had gone for electrification, you would be able to have many more stops, which would, be, which would bring a neighborhood regeneration to uh, all these neighborhoods that line it. They could be connected. Uh, so, you know, what we've suggested is, you know, more bridges, uh, active transportation routes beside those routes, and other ways of making sound barrier walls where they're required, and basically making connections between one part of the city and the other that has been historically, uh, historically disconnected. And these are opportunities, as I was saying, for complete regeneration. Transit, transit uh, improvements should bring public space improvements. A large infrastructure project should transform the city at the same time and not maintain the disconnection or uh, you know, consolidate the disconnection that's happened in the past. So these are the things uh, that our office has been concerned about in the last several months, working with community groups on, on these kind of zones of the city. So I wanted to kind of end with that plug that these are things, these are the middle spaces that are important to any kind of infrastructure project in the city and to any architectural project as well. So I think that was my last slide. Thank you.